fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and the haughty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. With his faithful Indian companion, Toto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. Hail, Silver. Away! This is the Lone Ranger. If you want to be a champion at anything, remember, others have done it in spite of obstacles. Take rodeo champion Bob Maynard. He did it the hard way. He proved champions are made, not born. Bob didn't even have the advantage of growing up on a western ranch. As a boy, he lived in Chicago. But Bob started riding when he was eight years old. At 14 in California, he became a stable hand. Today... Bob Maynard is one of the top money winners in rodeo competition. He sure is, Lone Ranger. And like many champions in all sports, Bob still chooses Wheaties for his favorite training dish. There's no question about it. Champions are made, not born. And there's no question why champions choose Wheaties for their training diet. They want that famous wheat energy. They get it with Wheaties because there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Champions are made, not born. Get on your way with Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions. Dan Reed, the nephew of the Lone Ranger, rode into Eagle City and dismounted in front of the local office of the Hendricks Freight Line. As Dan entered the office, a mild-mannered man looked up from the desk. He was the Eagle City manager, named Sam Slater. Mr. Slater? That's right. My name's Dan Reed. Have you a message for me? Message for you? Well, no, I haven't. Is there supposed to be a message here for you? Well, I I expected to meet friends here in Eagle City, but I haven't seen them. I thought they might have left a note for me. Not that I know of. I, I guess I'll be along soon. You're welcome to sit down and wait, son. It's cooler in here than outside in the sun. Thanks, Mr. Slater. I think it it... looks like there might be trouble. Jake Ronson's heading this way with a couple of friends. Oh? Jake owns a small gold claim. He's mad because of what it costs to ship his ore. You, Slater. Oh, Jake, take it easy. Oh, let me alone, Joe. Slater, you think because of Hendricks Land is the only freight in outfit you can rob people like me, eh? Jake, I don't set the prices. They're the same on all the Hendricks Lines. They're too high. That ore shipment of mine. I told you not to ship the ore. You should have had it refined in the stamping mill and freighted the refined gold, same as everyone else. Don't tell me how to run my business. All right, Jake. And don't get the idea that the other mine owners and I can't do without the Hendricks line. We're through with your outfit. Uh, well, that's up to you, Jake. To me and the others, huh, boys? Right, I'm serving notice, lady. I'm going to start a freight line with honest prices. And I'll take away your business. I'm going to bust you with the Hendricks outfit. Are you, Jake? Yeah. I've already talked to some of the men. They promised me their business. You'll learn a costly lesson, Jake. So you threaten me, eh? No, 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 Jake. I owe you... You figure to teach me a lesson, eh? I expect you'll send gunmen to attack my wagons. Nonsense. You just try it, Slater. I'll be ready for your gunslingers. I'll have my wagons guarded. There'll be no gunplay as far as I'm concerned. You don't fool me with mealy mouth talk. I'll be ready for your attacks, you thieving crook. Jake, that's about enough. You're free to complain all you want about the Hendricks rates. But don't you call me a crook. Another threat, huh? You hear that, boys? Now, get out. Yes, I'm gone. But I'll break you, you crook. Get out. Come on, boys. Tonto arrived in town a few minutes after Jake Ronson and his friends had left the office. Dan Reed met his Indian friend and rode with him to the Lone Ranger's camp on Eagle Mountain. There he told the masked man about the incident he had witnessed. The masked man was keenly interested. 
And then, uh, about ten minutes after Jake Ronson left with his friends, Tano rode into town, and we left right away. Dan, how did Slater take it when Ronson called him a crook? Golly, he was awfully mad. He said Ronson was mighty unfair. Ronson, plenty big fool. Pay freight and ore. Well, that's what Mr. Slater said. All the other mine operators get the ore refined, and then they pay freight on just the gold ingots. But Ronson insisted on shipping the ore just as it came from the ground. It was all packed in burlap sacks. Why him do thing like that? That's what I'm wondering. Mr. Slater said he tried to tell Ronson the freight bill would be more than the ore was worth. Ronson told him to mind his own business. He must have it. Yes? You think Hendrick's line crooked? As far as I know, Tonto, the company's very fair. Mr. Slater said Ronson would go broke if he tried to carry freight at reduced rates. I'd like to know what Ronson has in mind. Well, Kimasabi. Yes? Me scout around town for a few days. Maybe find out. Good idea, Tonto. Dan Weed and Tonto went into town the following day and returned to the camp after dark with a report. Jake Ronson wasn't fooling, sir. He really intends to start a freight line. Today he bought a heavy wagon. That's right, and him talked to miners. Him promised to cut freight rate. He can't do it without losing money. What's behind his plan? The following night, when Dan and Toto returned from Eagle City, they brought further news of Jake Ronson's activities. Today he bought six horses. Uh, and plenty good horses. And him hired driver. And good shotgun guard. Then he has one wagon ready to go. The next day, Jake Ronson spread word that he would make a special announcement that evening in the cafe. So instead of returning to camp as usual at sundown, Dan Reed and Toto remained in town to hear the announcement. Soon after dark, the cafe was crowded with mine operators and others who wanted to hear what Jake had to say. Sam Slater was not among those present. But the sheriff was there, and so were Dan and Toto. Presently, Dan nudged his Indian friend. Tonto, Bronson's climbing up on a chair. Uh, maybe now he make an announcement. Hey, Quiet, Tonto! Quiet, let's hear what Ronson has to say. Quiet, Jake. You wait and hold up the service. Quiet, Al. Well, Jake, I reckon you've all heard about my new freight line. I want you to know that I'm going ahead with my plans despite the threats. Threats? What are you talking about? Yeah. Oh, yes, Jake. I've had a couple of letters that threatened trouble for me and my wagons if I tried to compete with the Hendricks outfit. Well, Jake, you didn't tell me you'd had threats. I didn't mention the letters, Sheriff, because they were unsigned. I couldn't prove that Sam Slater wrote them. Well, I know that doesn't sound like Sam Slater. Where are the letters? I burned them. That shows how little I think of Slater's threats. Boys, I say this is a free country. No one has the right to stand in the path of progress or to stifle competition. All right, all right, all right, all right. Of course, if you mine operators are afraid to use my freight and service, I'll go broke. Then the Hendricks line will have things its own way. And be free to keep on robbing. Now, wait, 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 wait. My wagon starts for St. Joe one week from today. My rate for carrying gold bullion is just half of what the Hendricks people charge. Well, you'll have my business, Jake. Uh, yeah, mine too. Count on me, Jake. I'm all for you. Well, bust, Hendricks. Yeah, well, all right, boys, thanks. I knew I could count on you. I'll uh, have my office open to receive your shipments later in the week. Right now, I'm going home to do some paperwork, but uh, I want to show my appreciation to you. The refreshments are on me. As Jake Ronson left the cafe, Dan Reed turned to Toto and said, Do you think we should start for camp right away? You want to start now, Dan? Well, I'm mighty hungry. <laughs> A well, half hour make no difference. Lone Ranger not mind if we stay. Good. Jake Ronson will pay for the meal. He no, said Dan, we're... no. We pay for supper. Well, all right, as long as we eat. I'm starved. Because of the decision to eat before starting the trip to the Lone Ranger's camp, Dan and Tonto were in the cafe a half hour later when a man rushed through the batwing doors and shouted excitedly. Hey, Sheriff! Oh, I'm glad you're still here. I ran all the way. What's the trouble, Sandy? I was passing Doc Smith's house on my way home. Doc was standing in the open door. He asked me to hurry back here and tell you. Well, tell me what. Is Doc in trouble? No, 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 not Doc. It's Jake Ronson. Jake, what about Jake Ronson? He's in Doc's house. Someone shot him.
The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. Did you ever wonder who'd replace present-day Wheaties champions like Mickey Mantle or Roy Campanella when they finally retire? You know, as a sports announcer, I'm Mel Allen. I bet it's just an average guy, maybe the boy next door. Sure, maybe he can't run or hit like Mantle or Campanella as of now, but don't forget, champions are made, not born. Mickey Mantle wasn't born a champion. Gosh, when he was only 12, he practiced hitting for hours and started training with Wheaties. Roy Campanella, a Wheaties eater since he was 13 years old, spent years learning enough baseball to make the grade with the Dodgers. Roy and Mickey started with no more raw ability than hundreds of other baseball hopefuls, but they got on their way with hard practice and the right food. You'll notice they both chose Wheaties, and they still choose Wheaties. Why Wheaties? I can tell you the big energy reason. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. I'd like to see you a champion someday. And just remember, champions are made, not born. Get on your way with Wheaties, breakfast of champions. Now to continue. The sheriff left the cafe and hurried to the doctor's house a quarter mile away. He was followed by Dan and Tonto and half a dozen men whose curiosity outweighed the desire for further refreshments. The group crowded Doc Smith's living room where Jake Ronson sat with one leg braced by splints and heavily bandaged. The doctor said, There's not much I can tell you, Sheriff. I heard a shot and went out the front door to investigate. I saw Jake Ronson lying in the street. Did you see who fired the shot? No. Looks like the bullet hit Jake in the leg. Yes, the tibia was broken. The what? The bone between the knee and the ankle. I carried Jake in here for treatment. I sent for you because I thought you should know about it. It may have been an attempted murder. Uh, Sam Slater's workout bet. That's right. Jake, what have you got to say? Nothing. Jake, I've got to arrest the man who shot you. Now, forget it, Sheriff. I'll handle things my own way when I get back on my feet. You know who shot you? I wouldn't name anyone unless I had proof. Did you see him? Sheriff, I'm not going to say anything about the shooting. But I'll tell you this. It's not going to scare me out of starting my freight line. My wagon will start on schedule. Good for you, Jake. That's the talk, and we'll stick with you. Sure. Jake, Sheriff, I'll tell you this much. If anything happens to my freight wagon or the gold cargo... It's because it's Sam Slater. Remember that. We won't forget it. I'll Jake. remember it, Jake. Is Slater the one who shot you? I'm not talking about that. All right, Jake. I can't make you talk. But I'm going to call on Slater and see what he has to say. Later that night, Dan Reed and Tonto told the Lone Ranger all that had happened in town. Seated on the ground close to the campfire, a masked man listened with interest. So when the sheriff went to talk to Sam Slater, several of the townsmen tagged along, and Tano and I went with him. Slater was alone in his house. How did he react when he heard that Ronson had been shot? Well, he seemed surprised. Oh. He said he knew nothing about the shooting. Tano and I stayed and talked to him for a few minutes after the others left. He's mighty worried, sir. Why? Well, he figures he'll be blamed if anything happens to Ronson's first wagon. Uh, him offer damn job. He did? Yes, sir. He said he needs someone to help him with the bookkeeping. Besides, he'd like to have someone who could swear to an alibi in case he does need it. Dan, that might be a good idea. Well, you, you mean you want me to take the job? Yes. But Slater will want me to live at his house. That's all right. It'll be for only a week or so. Hanna will see you every day to receive a report. We'll know a lot more about Slater by the time the Ronson line starts operations next week. Dan Reed rode into town the next morning and went to work for Slater. During the following week, Jake Ronson conducted business from his home, where he was confined with his leg in a heavy cast. On the appointed day, the freighter was supposed to start at noon, but Ronson found last-minute details that needed attention. It was late afternoon when everything was ready. With the aid of crutches and friends, Ronson made his way to the center of town where his freighter was ready to start. Tonto and Dan were in the crowd that gathered. 
Did you get a copy of the route tunnel? Uh, let me get it. Uh, you and the Lone Ranger are going to follow the wagon to make sure nothing happens? Isn't that right. After wagons start, me ride to camp and tell Lone Ranger. Then we follow. I wish I could go with you. Oh, Kimosabe say, you stay on guard. I know. Are you going to follow the gold all the way to St. Joe? Uh, me not know. Hey, you have the best guard in the county. You should get through all right. Well, we'll make it, Mr. Ronson. You want the guard to keep your eyes on Oh, he sure will. Where to go? Get up there! Right there. Right there. Right there. there it goes, Tonto. Uh-huh. And now me go tell Lone Ranger. The wagon trail follows a winding route through the rugged mountains to avoid steep slopes. Because of this, the freighter had to travel over five times the beeline distance between Eagle City and a landmark known as Blue Spring. The wagon was halfway to Blue Spring when darkness gathered. Get up there! Come on! You going to keep driving all night? Depends on the moonlight, shotgun. I'll keep going as long as I can see the trail. I want to make up the time we lost at the start. Get up there! Come on! Get up there! At midnight, the moon was high and bright, and Blue Spring was just ahead. There, a man waited in ambush. Though the ambusher had left town after dark, he had reached Blue Spring ahead of the freighter by riding over the mountains in a relatively straight line instead of following the meandering wagon trail. He waited behind a rock. When he heard the approaching wagon, he gripped his carbine and levered a cartridge into position. I'll get the guard first, then the driver. <laughs> Ranger and Toto were on the wagon trail when they heard the gunfire some distance ahead. Guns mean trouble. Let's go, Toto. Once the watch count. The last man and the Indian raced ahead on the rough road, guiding their horses around dangerous turns at breakneck speed. Jake Ronson had already started to remove the gold from the wagon. He was holding a heavy ingot of bullion when he heard the approaching hoofbeats. As he glanced at the back trail, he saw two horsemen ride into view. His carbine had been left beside the trail, so he dropped the gold and drew his six guns. Frenzy of fear, he opened fire without realizing that the range was too great for accurate shooting. Bronson was gripped by panic when his gun was empty. Thinking only of escape, he leaped to the roadside, raced through the underbrush, and mounted his waiting horse. Despite the gunfire, the Lone Ranger and Toto did not slacken their speed. They saw the gunman holster his empty weapon and ride away. A moment later, the masked man and his friend drew rein beside the halted wagon. Kimasabi, two men in wagon. Do what you can for them, Toto. I'm going after that gunman. Easy, Scott. Easy, The Lone Ranger turned off the trail and started an uphill pursuit. Tonto climbed aboard the freighter. He found that the guard and driver, though wounded, were still alive. Both were unconscious. The driver opened his eyes while the Indian was dressing his wound. Oh, now you'll be all right. Wound, not kill. Dry gulcher. Shot without warning. You and guard both live. A meat turn wagon, tie scout behind, then drive to town. Take it to doctor. The gold. Gold safe. Do not worry. Meanwhile, the Lone Ranger pursued the fugitive to the top of the mountain and down the other side. On the comparatively level floor of the valley, he called on Silver for greater speed. Come on, Silver. Fast to me, fella. Silver seemed to know that he was expected to overtake the horse ahead. With every stride, the powerful stallion gained on the man ahead. Come on, Silver. Silver closed the gap. The Lone Ranger was riding alongside the gunman. He held his rope. Let me alone, Joey. Rain in or I'll rope you. You'll never get me alive. I want you. A rope snaked through the air. The noose dropped over the fugitive. Hold oh, oh, back. He was pulled from the saddle. He hit the ground and rolled. Oh. Then wailed in pain. Oh, my leg. My leg. Easy, it's... silly big fella. You should have stopped your horse. Oh, this time my leg is really broke. Oh, help me, help me. I, I can't stand the pain. Jake Ronson. So you're the gunman. At about 8.30 in the morning, Dan Reed and Sam Slater were on their way from Slater's house to the Hendricks' office when a crowd of men approached. You, Slater! We want you! Dan, those men look ugly. What's you're bringing ropes. We'll fix you. Try to steal our gold, huh? Now, hold on, gents. What's wrong? A plenty. Ronson's freighter was stuck up. The garden driver was yes. shot. Mr. Slater didn't do it. He hired it, Dan. No, no, gents. I swear I didn't. The agent brought the wagon into town a few minutes ago. Doc is working on the garden driver right now. Jake Ronson said you'd do something like that? No, I swear. This is the first I knew of it. Grab him, boy! Oh, no. And the kid, too. Take them both. Hold on there, you crazy galoot! Sheriff, stop these men. Oh, oh! Sheriff, we just...
saw the ransom freighter. The engine told us about the ambush. You let Dan and Slater go. They didn't do it. But, uh, Sheriff, well, look over yonder, boys. Hey. Our deputies are carrying a man into my office. Where? You see who he is? It's Jake Ransom. Well, yeah, and this time his leg is really busted. What? Really busted? It took the man who what? caught him all night to bring him through the hills from the place where he ambushed his own freighter. Hey. That's right, boys. Ransom schemed to get a lot of gold on a freighter. He planned to dry gulch the garden driver and take the gold for himself. And he planned that Slater here'd be blamed what? for it. But Branson had a broken leg. That was a fake. I got the whole story from Doc Smith while he was working on the garden driver of the freighter. Branson persuaded Doc to help him fake the story of a broken leg. Branson. So we'd all think Slater had taken a shot at Branson. That's there. right. Doc didn't know that Branson planned to use a broken leg as an alibi while he went out and tried to murder his own garden driver. Well, Doc wouldn't have any part in an attempted murder. So he told the whole story. Then Ronson started the freight line, figuring he'd get rich with one good haul by stealing all the gold. That's right. Well, and he'd exactly. have gotten away with it if that masked man hadn't come along. We ought to lynch Jake Ronson. Uh, uh, the law will deal with him, boys. Uh, uh, now lynch you him. let this be a lesson to you men. You can't get something for nothing. Any right-thinking man would look for something underhanded when Ronson offered to freight gold at half price. Slater, yeah. I reckon we owe you an apology. That's all right, gents. I'm glad the truth came out. Oh, uh, you, Dan. Yes, sir. Masked man said he'd meet you in Tonto and camp. Yes, sir. Well, I reckon he started for camp already. Dan, is that masked man a friend of yours? He sure is. Well, I'm deeply indebted to him. Aren't we all? Who is he? Why, you should know that, Slater. He's the Lone Ranger. Like little letter O's. You know, Cheerios is made from oats, and every delicious spoonful of Cheerios and milk is a real muscle building food. Each spoonful contains vitamins, minerals, and proteins your body needs. Yes, the good things in a Cheerios breakfast do good things for your body, help you have healthy nerves, good red blood, strong bones, and muscles. Have Cheerios every morning. Then you'll hear people say, He's feeling his Cheerios. a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated is created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. Your announcer, Fred Foy. is brought to you by General Mills every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at this same time. Be sure to listen.